Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in his new series, Soldiers of the Cross. Today, a lesson that'll share how to stand up for Jesus with conviction and power. Join us for the timely message, The Courage of a Good Soldier. Have your Bible, please turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We're in a series called Soldiers of the Cross. Last week we talked about the discipline of a good soldier. And this week we want to talk about the courage of a good soldier. You know, the Bible tells us that we are soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy Chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul says to Timothy, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Now, in order to be a good soldier, you have to be disciplined, and you have to have courage. You can't be a good soldier if you are a coward. Winston Churchill, the great prime minister of England during World War II, said this, courage is the most important of the virtues because it's the one virtue that makes all the others possible. Courage. You know, it's interesting, in Revelation chapter 21, see, Revelation 21 and 22 speaks of the eternal state. Everyone has been judged, and now it's the believers in heaven, and it talks about the glories of heaven and and how those who overcome will inherit these things, and God will wipe every tear from their eye. And then it says in Revelation 21, 8, it gives a list of eight classifications of sinners who are going to miss out. Their part is going to be in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. And it talks about murderers. It talks about abominable people. It talks about sorcerers and idolaters. But the number one classification on the list. The first one mentioned, but for the cowardly. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable persons and murderers and idolaters and immoral people and sorcerers, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The cowardly. Now, the Bible makes it clear that when God saves a person, he saves that person and gives that person not a spirit of fear, but of power and love and discipline. 2 Timothy 1.7 in the God's Word version says, God didn't give us a cowardly spirit, but a spirit of power, love, and good judgment. I love the one-time motto of the French Foreign Legion. It says this, if I falter, push me on. If I stumble, pick me up. If I retreat, shoot me. If I retreat, shoot me. Hey, there is no retreat in the Lord's army. And there's no room for cowardice in the Lord's army. God has not given us a cowardly spirit, a spirit of fear, but one of power and love and sound judgment. So what do you do if you're here today and you say, good grief, I really struggle with with this thing called courage. I really struggle to be a, a brave, outspoken Christian. I mean, There are opportunities for me and and opportunities to witness, and I just feel the fear rising up, and I don't say anything, and, you know, to my friends and to people at school and people at work, opportunities for me to speak up for Jesus, but I just get so afraid. I just shrink back in fear. I'm afraid on social media to to say anything because I don't want uh, the backlash. What do you do if you really struggle with fear? Well, we all struggle with it. Here's the good news. When we see the disciples, they started out so fearful. Remember, when Jesus was arrested, all of them fled, and they, he told them that. You're all going to flee because of me. And, and remember, Peter said, no, no, I'm not going to flee. I'm r- willing and ready to go with you to prison and to death. He said, are you really, Peter? Because before a cock crows twice, you're going to deny three times that you even know me. 
Peter said, no way, I would never do that. And what did he do? Just a few hours later, he went out and did it. He denied that he even knew Christ. He was scared when a servant girl said, surely you're one of them. Oh, I don't know this man. I don't know what you're talking about. He cursed and he swore, I don't know the man. That's Peter. But now Peter has a transformation because Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And the spirit of power is in him, and he becomes a courageous and bold witness. And what God did for him and for the other disciples, God can do for you. Now, Acts, the book of Acts gives us and shows us where the persecution came to the early church. And it shows us how the disciples were courageous in the face of persecution in the face of threats and in the face of intimidation. Acts chapter 3, you know, Acts 2, they get the Holy Spirit. Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 respond to the message, 3,000 were baptized. The church went from 120 in the upper room to 3,120, grew like crazy, and the church is born. Acts chapter 3 tells us about a beggar, a blind or a lame beggar. He'd been lame from his mother's womb. He's over 40 years old. He sits by the gate called Beautiful, and he begs alms. And Peter says, hey, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have I'll give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise up and walk. And this guy, all of a sudden, he is healed, healed by the name of Jesus. And he's walking and he's leaping and he's praising God. And everybody notices, hey, that guy used to be the lame beggar. And here he is praising God. He is healed. How did that happen? And Peter used that to launch into a sermon and lifted up the name of Jesus and told everybody it's by the name of Jesus that this man is healed. And he, he was the one that you guys crucified. Pilate wanted to let him go, but you said, no, not this man, but Barabbas. What shall I do with Jesus? Crucify him, crucify him. And he preached Jesus, and he preached very uh, straightforwardly. And the Bible says when the religious leaders heard what was going on, they were upset. Acts chapter 4, verse 1, and as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed because they, Peter and John, were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message, heard the word, believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. The church is growing from 120 to 3,000 to now 5,000 men plus women and children. They're a bunch in the church in Jerusalem. But the disciples are courageous. Now, I want you to notice some insights in Acts chapter 4 about a courageous soldier in the Lord's army. Three insights. Number one, Courageous soldiers know that boldness has consequences. If you're going to be bold and speak openly and plainly and powerfully for the Lord, there are going to be consequences with that. These guys got arrested. Well, why were they arrested? Because it says in verse 2 that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. The, The... group of religious leader, priest, captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees, the Sadducees and the chief priests, those those one and the same, Uh, the chief priests were all Sadducees, and the chief priests and the Sadducees, they ran the temple. And so they didn't like what they were hearing. These guys were part of the Sanhedrin. We're going to run into them in just a couple more verses. Uh, They were the ones that crucified Jesus. They were the ones that brought him to Pilate. And now all of a sudden Peter is preaching about Jesus and the resurrection and calling people uh, to put their faith and trust in Jesus. And it says they were greatly disturbed. That means they were displeased. They were offended. They were worked up. They were annoyed. That's a strong word. They were ticked off. What are you doing preaching in this name? And so they arrested him. And they put him in in jail until they could come the next day before the Sanhedrin. Listen, why did they do that? Because they were preaching the truth. 
and you mark it down, the world will always be disturbed by the truth. Whether it's the world of godless government or whether it's the world of self-righteous Judaism, as these men represented, self-righteous Judaism, they're so far from what God wanted. They said about Jesus, they see the long-awaited Messiah, and what's their, what's their determination about him? He is Beelzebul. He is the ruler of the demons. He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. I mean, when the Son of God, God in the flesh, is right before them, that's how wrong they get it. And they crucified the Lord Jesus, disturbed by the truth. Hey, when, when we proclaim the true gospel, the unwavering gospel, the narrow gospel, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me. When we proclaim that, people get disturbed. The world will get disturbed. And you say, what is the world? The Bible says that the whole world, 1 John chapter 5, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world is cradled in the lap of the evil one, and the evil one hates the truth of the message of Jesus. Why? Because you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, shall set you free. I don't know if you saw Matt Walsh on Dr. Phil just the other day. He was debating the issue of transgenderism, and they brought him on. He's a conservative and an author and a commentator. He wrote a book about uh, Christianity is no place for cowards because we need to be courageous for Jesus. Well, he came on there, and these guys that are dressed up like girls and think they're girls and talk about, well, trans women are women. And he asked the question, he said, what's a woman? Uh, I, well, I, I, a woman is whatever, whatever a woman says. Well, what's a woman? How do you, you, you can't use the term woman if you don't define woman. So they're like, uh, you define woman. He said a woman is a, a female, uh, a, a person who has XX chromosomes, a person who has female reproductive organs. That's a, that's a woman. Well, we don't look at it like that. We say that a trans woman is a woman. He said you can't even define the word. Well, the crowd is all cheering for the guys dressed up like girls, and uh, this one guy... He's got a beard, and he's dressed up like a, it's a really creepy-looking girl. And uh, anyway, so he confronts them. Well, they said after that taping, they said, we have been traumatized, and we're having trouble sleeping since our encounter with Matt Walsh, that horrible person who asked us to define the word woman. Matt Walsh said, you know what? He said, I have more people saying stuff about me and my family in one day than they've had their whole lives. People say the most awful things about me because of the stand that I take. And he said, I sleep like a baby. You know why? Because I stand in the truth. That's why. The world will always be disturbed by the truth, and the world will always try to intimidate the truth. Always try to intimidate the truth. Now, People are hearing Peter's sermon, and they're responding, says verse 4. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Wow, it's, it's growing, and people are believing, and the religious leaders are getting very nervous because uh, we thought we got rid of this Jesus guy when we crucified him, but now they're preaching in his name, and now people are responding. And these people, Peter and John and the others, they're very popular with the people. It says in verse 5, And it came about on the next day that their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there. Annas ran the temple area. They used to call the temple area where they sold uh, sheep and money changers and all that stuff where Jesus cleaned out the temple twice at the beginning of his ministry, at the end of his ministry. They called that the bazaar of Annas. Annas used to be high priest. The high priest now was his son-in-law, Caiaphas. The high priesthood was governed by Rome, and you had to be a, a Jewish turncoat to even be in that. It was a political uh, experience, and uh, it's almost like working for the mob. 
And so you have Caiaphas. Annas is there, the high priest was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of high priestly descent. All those guys that were involved in the trial of Jesus when they said, uh, what need do we have of further witnesses? What say ye? He deserves death. And they spit in his face and slapped him in the face. And they decided that he needed to die. That's the group. And it says, and when they placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Now, when the court met, the Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin, it's 70 elders of the people, these religious muckety-mucks, plus one, the high priest. It was uh, Caiaphas at that time. So you would meet, and they would, they would uh, gather in kind of a semicircle as the court, and they would place you in the center. So here is Peter, and here is John against 71 of the elders of the people, the high court in Jerusalem, all the muckety-mucks with the chief priest presiding, the same usual suspects and the same uh, rotten people who tried their Savior, the Lord Jesus, and they're trying to intimidate them. And Peter and John are fishermen. It's going to go on to say they're uneducated, untrained men before all these guys that are so learned and so smart and have all their uh, fine clothes and have all their uh, degrees. That's who they stand up and have to present to. That can be an intimidating thing. I remember years ago I interviewed at, at a church for the position of pastor. This was when I was in Houston. And... Uh, they had, they had us in kind of, a, uh, kind of a semicircle type deal. They all sat there, and then Debbie and I were just sitting there in this, like, this little table and looking around, and, and uh, it was like, gee, this is fun. And uh, it, was, it was just awful, you know, and they're asking all these questions, and, uh, you know, it's like you're being grilled, you know. It's like, it's like uh, Joe Friday on Dragnet, you know, the lights in your face, and where were you on September 3rd? You know, that kind of thing. So this is an intimidating experience. These guys on the Sanhedrin can rule against you and you can die. That's what happened with Jesus. And here's the thing Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 3. Do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. They weren't afraid. They weren't intimidated. They knew that courageous soldiers, bold witnesses for Christ, there are going to be consequences. Okay, that's just part of of the deal. Second insight, courageous soldiers stand up for Jesus. Courageous soldiers stand up for Jesus. Now, here's the question. So, they get them there, and they're in the, the semicircle, and when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Oh, the name. You want to know the name. Let me tell you the name. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. Stop right there. Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter, same guy just a few weeks before, cursed and swore and said, I, I don't know this Jesus. Now he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's filled with power, and he gets ready to speak to them, and he's not afraid. It's obviously it's obvious that he's not afraid based on what he told them. And he knew that the Lord was going to provide for him. See, a, a courageous soldier, they trust the Lord for timely provision. God is going to provide for me in this hour when I'm called on the spot, when the spotlight is on me, the light is in my face, and I'm being challenged and called to make a defense. Jesus had told those guys, when they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he gives a response to them that has authority and power and conviction. See, a courageous soldier is going to speak with authority, with power, and with conviction. Why? Because he's not speaking from himself. 
He's not speaking just what comes out of his mind. He's not speaking the word of the preacher. He's speaking the word of God. Then Peter, verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health, whom you crucified. I mean, he's calling them out. This is not a uh, real mamby-pamby, let's be careful, how do I nuance this? No, he's just calling them out, just straight and plain. The name of Jesus, Jesus Christ, that means Jesus the Messiah. What did you guys, you religious leaders, do with the Messiah? You crucified him. I mean, you talk about... uh, Sticking, uh, putting salt in the wound. I mean, it's like, oh, here you go. You crucified God's Messiah. What did God do in response? He raised him from the dead. And you know what? Those guys on the Sanhedrin knew that Jesus had been raised from the dead. You say, how would, how did they know that? Matthew chapter 28. See, Jesus said there were soldiers that guarded the tomb. Because the chief priest said to Pilate, we know when that deceiver was alive, he said that he would rise from the dead. So uh, give us a guard that can guard the tomb so nobody will get in there because then the disciples will steal the body away and then the, the last deception will be worse than the first deception. And so Pilate said, here you have a guard. 16 Roman soldiers guarding the tomb or however many it was. I think I believe it was 16. And they're guarding the tomb. I mean, what kind of a deal is that? We're, what, are, what are you doing, uh, honey? Well, I got to go. Uh, I'm on duty. I'm guarding a tomb. Well, for what? Well, so nobody steals the body. Okay, that ought to be a pretty easy gig. Uh, yeah, except when God raises his son from the dead, and when the guards saw the angel and the stone rolled away and uh, the earthquake they felt, they fell as dead men and they went and reported to the chief priests and to the elders of the people and they told them everything that had happened. And the chief priests got together and consulted and the elders and the scribes and all these uh, Sanhedrin muckety-mucks and they said, what are we going to do? Uh, here's some money. Let's give these guys a big sum of money and they're to say that the disciples stole the body away. Ah, they know that's a lie. They know that's a lie. But that's what they're supposed to say. And they told the soldiers, here you go. Here's a big son of money. This is the lie that you are going to tell. And if you get into trouble with the governor because their penalty for uh, allowing the dead body, their prisoner, so to speak, to escape is their own lives. They would, they would be killed. And so if you get in trouble with the governor, we'll come to your aid and we'll make sure nothing happens to you. They're preaching Jesus and the resurrection, and these guys knew about the resurrection from the soldiers. And he tells them God raised him from the dead. By this name, this man stands here before you. They speak the truth with authority and with power and with conviction. And I love this. They make things crystal clear. Crystal clear. Watch verse 11. He, this Jesus, the Nazarene, he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the very cornerstone. Psalm 118. It's a messianic psalm. That's that's the psalm that they uh, referred to when Jesus came in on at the triumphal entry. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna means save, Lord, we beseech thee. And that's the word that's used in, the the phrase that's used in Psalm 118. Everyone knew Psalm 118 was a messianic psalm. And in Psalm 118, it says the stone which the builders rejected. This became the very cornerstone. But Peter makes it very pointed. The stone which was rejected by you, the builders, became the very cornerstone. Verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else. 
For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus, the one that you said was Beelzebub, the one that you said crucify him, crucify him, the one whom God raised from the dead, the name of Jesus. You can't get saved any other way than by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 12, 4, verse 12. Extremely clear. Now, the job of a preacher and the job of any witness, it's not primarily to be clever, although there's nothing wrong with being clever. I mean, it's nice to be clever. But the job is to be clear. I would much rather be clear than to just people say, well, it's very clever. I like the way he does things, very clever, but I'm not sure what he's saying. No, I want to be clear. And I I think God made me, if I'm a tool in the toolbox, it's a sledgehammer. That's kind of my tool. It's just boom. It's just, that's how I'm wired. I'm wired like an Old Testament prophet. Much more like John the the Baptist than than maybe John the Apostle. Just kind of, thus says the Lord, this is it. And Peter was like that. And I love that. Just very clear and very straightforward and doesn't pull any punches. And you might not like what he has to say, but you're not confused by what he has to say. Now, I was watching a video uh, in preparation for this sermon, and I remember when uh, a pastor of an extremely large church was on Larry King some years ago. And, you know, Larry King always likes to find out uh, about, you know, where you stand. He likes to talk about heaven and hell. Larry King, who was a Jew, he loves to ask those kinds of questions. You think uh, that Jews aren't going to heaven? Well, King says this to this pastor, because we've had ministers on who says that your record doesn't count, your good works don't count, you either believe in Christ or you don't. If you believe in Christ, you're going to heaven. And if you don't believe in Christ, then it doesn't matter what you do in life, you're not going And the pastor said, yeah, I don't know. There's probably a balance between, I I believe you have to know Christ, but I think that if you know Christ, you're you're a believer in God, you're going to have some good works. I think it's a cop-out to say I'm a Christian, but I don't ever do anything. And King says, well, what if you're Jewish or Muslim and you don't accept Christ at all? He says, well, you know, I'm very careful about saying who would and wouldn't go to heaven. I don't know. King says, if you believe you you have to believe in Christ to go to heaven, then that person that doesn't believe would be wrong, correct? He said, well, I don't know if I believe they're wrong. I believe uh, here's what the Bible teaches, and from the Christian faith, this is what I believe, but I just think that only God will judge a person's heart. I spent a lot of time in India with my father. I don't know all about their religion, but I know they love God, and I don't know. I've seen their sincerity, so I don't know. I know for me and what the Bible teaches, I want to have a relationship with Jesus. A lady calls in a little later in the program. She said, hello, Larry, you're the best. And she says some nice things to this this pastor. And then she says, I'm wondering, though, to this pastor, why you sidestepped Larry's earlier question about how we get to heaven. The Bible clearly tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life And the only way to the Father is through him. That's not really a message of condemnation, but a message of truth. Amen to this caller from Phoenix, Arizona. And the pastor says, yes, I would agree with that. I believe that. And King says, oh, so then a Jew is not going to heaven. No, here's my thing, Larry. I can't judge anybody's heart. You know, only God can look at somebody's heart. And so, I don't know. To me, it's not my business to say, you know, this one is, is going and this one's not going. I, I just say, here's what the Bible teaches, and I'm going to put my faith in Christ. And I just think it's wrong when you go around saying, you're not going, you're not going, you're not going, you're not going. And King says, but you believe your way. Oh, yeah, I believe my way. I believe my way with all my heart. But for someone who doesn't share it, they would be wrong, correct? He said, well, yes, well, I don't know. I don't know if I look at it that way. I would present my way, but I'm not going to let God, I'm going to let God be the judge of that. I don't know. I don't know. So you make no judgment on anyone. No. He said, what about atheists? You know what? I'm going to let someone, I'm going to let God be the judge of who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. I just present the truth, and I say it every week. You know, I believe it's a relationship with Jesus, but you know what? I'm not going to go around telling everybody else if they don't want to believe that, that it's it's going to be their choice. God looks at the heart. God looks at your heart, and only God knows that. 
Well, let me tell you something about the God that who knows that. He has told us in his word, there is salvation in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. The name of Jesus. You don't hear out of Peter's mouth before the Sanhedrin, one, I don't know. He knew. I know, as Paul said, whom I believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Hey, we make things crystal clear to people, and we speak the truth in love. We're not trying to be uh, ugly to people, but we make it clear to people, thus says the Lord. And the person who talked the most about hell in the Bible was Jesus, Jesus who is love incarnate. He talked about hell because hell is a real place, and he doesn't want anyone to go there. Well, it says in verse 13, now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were marveling and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. Uh, the 70 plus one, the Sanhedrin, all these muckety mucks, and you got two guys uneducated and untrained uneducated, agramatos, which means they're uh, unlearned, unlettered. They're illiterate. That's what that word means. And untrained, idiotes, from which we get the word idiot. They're idiotes. They're ignorant. These guys don't know anything. They had never been. Where is their d d diploma? Where, where is their sheepskin? They don't, who, who are they? These guys are fishermen. They're Galilean fishermen. And they have confidence, they have boldness to speak plainly. And they recognize them as having been with Jesus because they talked just like Jesus did. Jesus spoke with authority, and these guys are speaking with authority, and they're just, wow. And then they see the guy that had been lame from birth. All of a sudden, he's walking and leaping and praising God. He's exhibit A, and they're like, uh, they had nothing to say. Courageous soldiers, authority, power, and conviction, they make things crystal clear. So it says in verse 15, and when they had offered, uh, ordered them to, be, uh, to go outside out of the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men for the fact that a trustworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Oh, we so want to deny it, but we can't deny it because they've already seen it and everyone knows that it's true. Why would you want to deny it? Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Many believed when he did that. But the religious elite, they got together to plan out Jesus' death. We can't let him go on like this. If we let him go on like this, everyone's going to believe, and we can't have that because we'll lose our place. You mark it down. Religion is all about turf. That's what religious people care about, their turf, their area. We want to deny it, but we can't deny it. Verse 17, but in order that it may not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. They make things crystal clear. They obey God above all. You tell us, Jewish Supreme Court, not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. We can't do that. We can't do that. We cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. Our Lord, the God who created the heavens and the earth, he has commissioned us to be his witnesses. You shall be my witnesses, Acts 1.8, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Well, we can't do what you say because we have to do what he says. We obey God above all else. Many know the name John Bunyan. John Bunyan was a Puritan preacher and a pastor of the 1600s in England. He was arrested in 1661 for the terrible, horrible crime of preaching 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. Spent 12 years in prison. And he could have been released at any time if he would just agree and just sign off that he would not preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And he said this, I will stay in prison till the moss grows on my eyelids rather than disobey God. You know, they told John, the, uh, John MacArthur at Grace Community Church in California, Governor Newsom of California, you can't meet anymore because of COVID and, and you're going to become a super spreader. And so no more meetings. Uh, churches can't meet. Black Lives Matter can have their protests. Uh, that's okay. But churches can't meet. And John MacArthur and the elders of the church said, forget that. Uh, you know, in a nice way, they kind of said, well, thanks, governor, but stick it in your ear. We're going to meet. Because Hebrews chapter 10 from God says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of some. And so they were very, they didn't use the stick it in your ear. That was just a paraphrase. But they just said, we're not going to do that. And so California and Governor Newsom came upon them, and they started to find them, and they started to put the screws to them, and they told the police, go in there and break it up. And the police said, no, we like uh, Pastor John and the church. We're not going to do that. They're a friend to the police. And so they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't come in there, and so uh, they just kept worshiping. There are a lot of other churches that complied real quick. Oh, we don't want to do anything because we're supposed to be good Christians, and the Bible says that we're not supposed to go against authority, and that's our authority telling us to do that. Well, the authority in Acts chapter 4 told Peter and John don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus and they said whether it's right in the sight of God to obey you or obey God you be the judge we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard John MacArthur and they just kept on worshiping and the church just kept on growing and when that case was finally settled just a few months ago the state of California had to pay Grace Community Church $400,000 We obey God above all. Well, the, the Sanhedrin didn't like to hear that, but what could they do? They couldn't do anything. What were they on trial for? We healed a lame man, and we're speaking in the name of Jesus. And it says, and when they had threatened them further, verse 21, they let them go, finding no basis on which they might punish them on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. It says in verse 23, what happened next? Discovery number three, courageous soldiers lift their voices to the Lord. They were released from their, released from their arrest. It says in verse 23, and when they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord. They had a prayer meeting and said, Oh, Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Hey, you want to know something about prayer? This is a great prayer. You can learn from great prayers in the Bible. So this is a great prayer, and a great prayer starts with praise. They praise God. They don't come out and say, hey, let's all get together. Oh, God, we're in trouble. They're threatening us. What's going to happen? This, this is not supposed to happen. We're getting persecuted. Oh, oh God, you're going to have to intervene. No, they, they start off by praising God. Lord, we appeal to you. You're the God who created heaven and earth. You're the God who is over everything. Caiaphas and Annas and all those religious leaders are about as big as a pimple on a flea compared to you. Start your prayers always with praise. And one of the things you'll find when you read in the Bible about prayers, so much of the time prayers are started by mentioning that God is the creator of heaven and earth. Because that sets prayer in the right context. I'm praying to the God who is over it all. He sits as king at the flood. He sits as king forever. So start with praise. And then remember what the Lord has said. In your prayers, pray back the word of God to him. It says in verse 25, Who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said... And he quotes from Psalm 2. Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. 
For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. They're quoting Scripture back to God. See, sometimes we don't know what to pray. I'm not sure how to pray, and, and I don't know what to pray. Pray the word. God loves the word. Pray it back to him. Say, Lord, this is what you said. This is what you promised. I'm claiming what you have said. You know, we had for a while there that you don't hear it as much anymore, but the name it and claim it. Hey, what do you want from God? Just name it and claim it. You can't name it and claim it. You can't blab it and grab it. You, God has to name it. Now, when God names it, then you can claim it. If God says this is for you, then you can claim it. You say, well, like what? God has not given us a spirit of fear, a cowardly spirit, but of power and love and discipline. That's something that you can name and claim because God's already named it. God's already said, I didn't give you a cowardly spirit. I gave you a spirit of power. So why don't you walk in that? Why don't you claim that? We claim what God has already named, but you can't name it and claim it. God, I want to have a Mercedes. Well, just name it and claim it. I did. I got a Ford Explorer. And so that, it just doesn't work like that. Remember what he has said, and then ask in faith for boldness and divine power. Boldness and divine power. I love this prayer because here is the ask. And now, Lord, verse 29, take note of their threats. They were being threatened. And grant that your bondservants, your losses may speak your word with all confidence, with all boldness, while you extend your hand to heal. And signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. You pray for boldness, that we could do what? Speak your word boldly, with confidence. That word, with confidence, that, that word means Frankness, bluntness, assurance. See, you're going to be clear. You're going to tell people this is the way it is. Confidence. I have assurance that what I'm saying is not coming from me. It's coming from the Lord. That's why I've told you before, if people get mad at what I say, uh, take it up with God. I didn't write the book. I just preached the book. I, my job is to deliver the mail. You, you ever get mad at the mailman when you get a letter that you don't like? Well, how dare you, mailman? Give it... Hey, I didn't write it. I just delivered it. Take it up with the, uh, the guy that wrote it. Hey, you have a problem? Take it up with God. I didn't write the book. I'm just delivering the book, and I want to be faithful to deliver the book. Take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. And when you pray that kind of prayer, and God, that your hand would be uh, outstretched, to, to do miracles, to, to authenticate the message. That's what the miracles were for. They authenticated the message. Adrian Rogers wrote a little book one time. It was called Believe in Miracles but Trust in Jesus. It's not about the miracles. The miracles are just a way to get you to hear the message, to put your faith and trust in Jesus. And so they prayed that prayer, and they received an immediate answer. Boom. And when they had prayed, verse 31, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Hey, this is a prayer God longs to answer. And if you say, I don't have much courage, I don't have much boldness, I, I always waffle when somebody asks me, you know, 1 Peter 3, 15, always being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give an account of the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Pray what they pray. God, help me to speak your word with all confidence, with boldness. And the Lord says, if that's what you want, because that's definitely what I want, if that's what you want, I will do that for you. And the place where they gathered was shaken. God says, that's right. God put an exclamation point on that. That's a good prayer. Amen. Here you go. Here you go. And they began to speak the word of God with great boldness. Courageous soldiers. I'll close with this story. Many people who studied church history know the name John Chrysostom. 
He wasn't called John Chrysostom until after his death. Chrysostom is kind of a, a, a nice moniker that was given to him posthumously. It means golden mouth. And it recognized that this guy John, this early church father John, who lived in the 300s, died in 407 A.D., was some kind of preacher. Well, he got in trouble with the Roman emperor, as people do when they preach the truth. And he was preaching the truth. And so this Roman emperor named Archidius, he threatened banishment on John Chrysostom if he didn't stop preaching Christ. And Chrysostom had a back and forth with the emperor. And he said this, you cannot banish me, for the world is my father's house. The emperor said, then I will slay you. And Chrysostom said, nay, you cannot slay me, for my life is hid with Christ in God. Then your treasures will be confiscated. That can't be. My treasures are all in heaven where no one can break in and steal. Then I will drive you from men and you will have no friends. You can't do that either. I have a friend in heaven who said, I will never leave you or forsake you. That is a man of courage. That is a man of boldness. Now, I want to ask you, as you search your own heart, do you want to be that kind of a soldier? Hey, we're living in a time where people desperately need to stand up, stand up for Jesus as soldiers of the cross. It's time that we speak the truth plainly and boldly. It's time that we tell our neighbors and our friends and our loved ones who don't know Christ, if you die in the state you're in right now, you're going to go to hell forever and ever and ever. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to be helpful because I don't want you to go to hell. I want you to trust Christ and come to heaven with me. People need to hear the truth. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Who will stand up for Jesus? My friend, are you a soldier in the Lord's army? Have you ever received Christ as Savior and Lord? If not, today is the day for you. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, forgive me of all my sins, make me the person you want me to be. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that this program is making a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more at fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real